into us from under the ocean there, Chris, but we just about got the theme tune. Uh, just actually, about got it anyway. You're in the office, it's, aren't you? Not a prison uh, today. And it says uh, Friday 15th of October, so it looks like we've got the wrong slide deck up, haven't we? So shall I navigate to the one that we're actually doing today, which is not webinar number 43 it is, is not no webinar 54 so let's actually get the correct slides up i've also started the recording today's session will be recorded so here we are it is friday the 12th of november we haven't traveled back right. in time <laughs> uh i'll notice that i didn't update it should be xliv at the point shouldn't it, it um should, but yeah. for those of you who haven't who haven't joined us already my name is chris borison and I'm Jane Secker, and together we chair the uh, Copyright and Online Learning Special Interest Group for the Association for Learning Technology, as well as running the website copyrightliteracy.org. Indeed. So today it's going to be a good one. We've got the following. We've got some copyright news, as ever. Um, we've got some events. We've got some interesting research um, and some papers that have been written around this area. But the main event today is about becoming a copyright specialist. And we've got three fantastic speakers, Hannah, Simon and Kate, who we'll introduce later. Although many of you actually need, they need little introduction, being regular contributors to this webinar. But a, a really excellent topic, I think, and, and very kind of topical because there are a number of um, um, vacancies in this area going on at the moment and I know institutions looking at how they provide specialist support um, and as usual the future webinars anything more to say or should we crack on no 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 let's crack on yeah let's get started with uh, what we've been up to this week so yeah. last met um, uh, we um, we actually ran uh, so we have Halloween. We've also had bonfire night, haven't we, since we last met? So now we're we doing have. our monthly yes. webinars, um, and we ran this exciting competition to see if anybody could have a go at uh, creating what we called a cool pumpkin. We really wanted somebody to try and carve our logo in a pumpkin. Um, now, have to say, a bit disappointed with the number of entries. So if the community community could kind of step up their game for the next competition we do, because there was a T-shirt in the offing as well uh for for the 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 cool uh gang t-shirt to win anyway um we did get an entry didn't we and we, we did have one winner. entry and the good <laughs> thing about it is that it was absolutely amazing it was brilliant so nora and cameron uh from london south bank university posted this the pumpkin with copyright symbols for eyes it's scary grin spelling out the word infringement um so that that was pretty special it is amazing, that was amazing. So, unfortunately it doesn't look like nora's joining us today we have dropped her a line and we are going to arrange to get her uh t-shirt sent to her as well um yeah there's actually um if if uh if we put the link up to that the tweet that she sent um or if you go on twitter and have a look for cool pumpkin um you do find she took like about four or five pictures of it and it's amazing it is absolutely amazing so I think a well-deserved uh, cool uh, cool gang T-shirt going to to Nora, and just uh, to let you know that you know we we do expect a better effort in our next competition. We'd like we'd like to actually have to do some proper judging, wouldn't we, Chris? We would, yeah. And it is the seasonal time is almost upon us. Let's not talk too much about that. I think it's still a bit early, but none of we are hoping that we might be able to get something going that maybe towards the end of the year we would have some participation in. Absolutely, yes. Um, yes. Right, I am grabbing that, that tweet uh, link. Are you going to pop that in the chat? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Although it would probably be easier, Jane, if you were, if you could do this stuff, because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm out of my comfort zone here. I'm normally surrounded by all of my guitars and my tech and oh, <laughs> back in the office. Nonetheless, stop groaning. I'm going to stop moaning. Let's move on. Um, so it. just You've a reminder it. that our webinar blog archive is on this page so i'll leave that to you jane to put the link yeah i'll do it I'll we are also working don't worry also to say we're working greg um walters at glasgow um has been working very hard with steeler alt to create the youtube um live and a youtube playlist of, of of the webinar recordings as well so once we've got that all up and running and we've agreed how everything's going to work um, we will be sharing 
the links to that. I think they're actually already on there. You could search them yeah, on YouTube. There's, there is a, there's a playlist them. actually at the moment um, on YouTube mm -hmm. that I'll put up with some of the webinars. Um, and I think we've got a link on the page actually that goes to it as well. Um, but okay. you will, what you will see is properly indexed um, and all the kind of previous recordings going up um, in, in over the next few months or so. So yeah, really grateful yeah. to Greg um, and to Alt for getting that arranged for us. Excellent. Right, on to copyright news. Coming to you from under the ocean again. <laughs> okay, uh, we've got a couple of events that we talked about last time, but just reminders that learning on screen with the fantastic Bartolomeo Maletti running a course on copyright and creative reuse in education. It's an online course. Um, and that's on the 30th of November, I think. So I think it is. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll just pop that. a link into that one. Yeah. So yeah. if anyone uh, wants to go on that course, the um, next one is um, we have the, the the booking still open. I think for the site winter forum. Um, that's um, going to be um, on the 25th of November. So a couple of weeks time, but we're going to have a few. Um, uh, events coming up and there's some really great speakers at that event um, so I've just popped in the link to the Eventbrite we can get tickets for that um, and uh, yeah um, uh, looks yeah another good event um, something else that's a little bit further ahead in the future um, I'm a bit of a copyright history nerd um, went to a great talk um, by Kathy Bowery um, that Create organised earlier this week. Um, she's an Australian academic who was talking about um, kind of copyright and authorship. And um, but there's there's actually going to be um, a webinar um, or an event happening um, in relation to all the digital resources um, that that Create have been creating on um, copyright history. So I've just popped that in there. I think that event is actually the 15th of December. So it's a, a little way ahead, um, but looks looks like a really interesting. And, and if you're not on the Create mailing list, what I would say is it's really worth signing up to. You get a weekly email from them um, about the sort of stuff that they've got going on. And um, yeah, really. And, and some, just just for those of you that aren't familiar with Create, it's the research centre located um, at the University. Glasgow and also um, University of Bournemouth that uh, have been doing work for many years in looking at copyrights, um, history, but also copyright policy supported by evidence making. And they've created this uh, copyright evidence wiki, which you've got there and also supported copyright user. Um, so an excellent um, thing to, to be aware of and to be following if you're not already. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So the new research thing, that we. Yeah, yeah, yeah this is good, isn't it? Yeah. You doing it or am oh, I doing you, it? <laughs> you, you, no, you, you can do this one. You explain it. OK, so um, th we um, yeah, we picked up this article um, that was published in the Journal of Copyright in Education and Librarianship um, from two Canadian um, academic librarians. Um, Cel Celine and Amanda um, have uh, written a, a really in-depth de in article about copyright anxiety or copyright chill um, if you want to find out more about the difference between those two things and the research they did i recommend reading the full article but what we're really pleased about is um, they wrote us um, a summary so um, a, a kind of way of promoting the article but also um, we've sort of found sometimes you know having just a more accessible summary um, gets people more interested in it and actually uh, yeah, we've had like huge traffic on our blog this week with people coming mm. um, uh, to read um, the post that is then taking them obviously to the article. Um, but we're hoping to do some more collaboration, aren't we, with Celine and Amanda? Um, we are and indeed. Potentially some more research um, about uh, how this copyright anxiety scale that they've developed. So uh, it's what, yeah, have a have a look and watch this space. Yeah, and copyright chill. It's not the same thing as Netflix and chill, is it? No, it is not, Chris. No. no. Okay, right. No. So let's move no. on. Um, move uh, on. Yes. Uh, I didn't hear that. Josie Fraser, 
So you actually went to see Dosi talk earlier this week at the Creative Commons event where she shared the work she's been doing on, on the Zoom. ethics of open share. Okay, <laughs> yes. so uh, you, you explain. Yes, it's, you made it sound like I actually went out of my house somewhere. But no, yeah, this is uh, some work that Creative Commons have been doing. They've got four working groups, um, one of which um, is uh, headed up by Josie Fraser, um, who is at the Heritage Lottery Fund, I think now. Um, and um, but Josie's um, writing um, a post. It's called Beyond Copyright: The Ethics of Open Sharing. And um, it, it was a sort of consultation in the in the first instance, and then they've kind of got a working paper out there um, that's meant to spark further discussion and contribute to the debate um, about kind of you know going way beyond, as I say, um, a, a copyright. Talking about when you might want to share content, the ethics of doing that when it's not appropriate to share as well. It's good. It's a good piece. So, and it's a 12 minute read according to Medium. So uh, you, you can you can sit down for knowing it's not too long. Okay, Good. I think I think that's it, isn't it, on the copyright I news? I think that that's us for copyright news, yeah, for the time being. Um, so we, we move on to um, topic of today, which is becoming a copyright specialist. Um, and we'll introduce our guest speakers in a moment. Uh, but the background to this, we thought we'd give some uh, context because we were involved in writing a, uh, a paper, a uh, report with Philippa Hatch, who I have seen is on the participant list. Hello, good morning, Philippa. Um, so Philippa, Jane and I uh, did a study. Happy days, uh, happy copyright. days at the University of Kent was, when we were we did indeed, getting yeah, into all that data, in, weren't we? But four years ago, we were um, uh, asked you to fill out a, and I'm trying to copy them. You can paste the URL in there. Um, okay. So we got some findings from it. So uh, copyright specialists in education, cultural institutions, who are they and what do they do? Um, and a lot of it was to try to um, uh, see really are they the copyright police? Because I think that's how they often people in our types of roles have been perceived over the years. Um, but what exact what positions they were in, uh, where do they sit within the organization? And what did they actually do every day? Um, so what did we find? Um, yeah, some interesting stuff. So we found um, so we we'd actually done an earlier survey um, of um, copyright um, in across libraries, cultural heritage institutions, copyright literacy survey that we did in 2015. And um, we found really similar findings in this later survey. We found 66 percent of institutions had a designated copyright officer. Now, what's interesting is we've we've always said, well, it, yeah, but it's higher in higher education because 66 percent of institutions included public libraries who responded, national libraries, etc. Um, and in higher education, according to the research we did in 2015, it's about 74 percent. So um, it's it, it's more reliable, actually, to use the earlier data because it was a much bigger sample than, than filled in uh, the second survey. Um, but we did find most of these people are based in the library, most, but kind of, I guess, you know, there is quite a percentage who are not. So 63 percent. Um, but also, interestingly, in addition or uh, sometimes instead of having a copyright specialist, 65 percent of institutions had additional staff who were involved in copyright matters. So it touched on um, other people's jobs. Um, and we could see that there was quite a significant investment in copyright support. One of the things in the report was about um, what pay grade people were on and stuff like that. So if you're interested in that, the data is, as I say, now a couple of years um, old, but um, there's some interesting stuff um, in there. We also um, we asked people about where their what their favorite sources of copyright advice were. And obviously this podcast or this this podcast, this webinar didn't exist, did it? Neither did our podcast. So um, uh, what came up really, really strongly was that people use List CopySeq, which I'm sure we would probably all say similar things still. People went to the legislation and they also went to the IPO website. Um, so these were the kind of um, the, the top places and people were actually using books quite a bit. So we put an example of a book that might be written about copyright. <laughs> a a yeah. random and neutral <laughs> example of a book. The <laughs> other <laughs> books are available and I would say <laughs> that all of the copyright books in the facet range are all excellent and I would uh, recommend looking all of them. They all have something slightly different to offer. 
of course. Yeah. Okay, so without further ado, I think we should hand over to our speakers because we have got three fabulous speakers who are going to join us. And um, they're going to go in the order that's on the slides. Um, they're each going to talk for um, up to 10 minutes. And then we're going to hopefully have some time for questions at the end. So um, I think first up um, is going to be uh, Hannah Pyman, who's at the University of Essex. Um, Hannah has um, done some amazing work on copyright. Anyone who's played the copyright Doe game that she developed um, with Kat Sunsbo is an amazing, um, fun game. And um, we've, you know, really, it's been great, Hannah, actually having you as part of our community and um, seeing you sort of develop from a new professional into somebody, um, you know, who's really getting their feet under the table now. So Hannah, um, I'm going to hand over to you. I'm going to get your slides up um, and uh, hopefully you're uh, ready to go. Can you can you just do a sound check with Hannah? Yes, I'm ready. Can you hear me? Yes, can hear you. Excellent. So um, just pop in your slides up now and uh, you should be able to navigate through them. So Perfect. take it away. Thank you. Thanks very much for the introduction, Jane. Um, so yeah, I'm Hannah. I'm from the University of Essex. Um, I want to first of all uh, put a quick apology out because I have got some background noise going on that you may or may not hear as I go through. So apologies for that before I start. Um, second disclaimer, I realise now that I've termed my presentation becoming a copyright expert and actually um, it was copyright specialists. So I feel like I've already over egged myself before we begin. But anyway, um, <laughs> I wanted to say, first of all, um, that I wouldn't necessarily describe myself as an expert at all. Um, I still feel very relatively new to copyright. Um, so what I'm really going to talk about is how I have learned and how I'm still learning about copyright through my work. OK, so um, first of all, I'm going to start by talking about how I got into copyright, um, which was through my work in interlending and document delivery and um, working on reading lists. So um, I started in the library at Essex as a graduate trainee straight after university. And after this, I got my first permanent role in interlending and document delivery. Um, so copyright came into this with regard to copyright exceptions for interlending. Um, making scans of theses, document delivery in general really um, overlaps quite a lot with copyright. As I learned more about these kind of things, um, I began questioning some of the policies that we had in place around interlending. Um, and it seemed that mostly when I asked why we did things the way we did, um, the answer I got was kind of, that's just how we've always done it, which I'm sure many of you will be familiar with. Um, so when I was met with that, um, I started to look into ways that we could reshape some of our policies. Um, and it started with just really basic things like we'd always been printing articles because we thought that copyright meant that we had to give them out in print rather than digitally, um, things like that. So just little things that helped me to start to learn more about copyright and how we could be using it in a, a better way for our students, really. Um, my role then developed to also include coordinating the digitisation of core resources as we moved to using Talisus via reading lists. Um, so suddenly in my role, I was making decisions on our use of the CLA and ERA licenses. And I was using Talis Aspire digitised content to make, manage our digitisation service. Um, so as you can imagine, I learned quite a lot about copyright quite quickly um, through doing this. Um, and especially was learning more about copyright exceptions um, and using these to allow as broad a use as possible of our core resources on reading lists where the CLA licence didn't cover them. Um, so that was a way that I really learned a lot more about copyright a bit more broadly than I had before. Um, through my time in this role, I also began educating academics on all of these points um, as I was teaching them how they could add resources to their reading lists in kind of a copyright compliant way. <clears throat> and I needed to really establish what those academics needed to know in terms of copyright to create their reading lists legally, um, but also what they didn't need to know. So kind of getting that fine line between what we as copyright specialists need to know and what our kind of target audience for these things need to know as well. Um, so that also helped me to kind of establish more um, what is essential knowledge about copyright within our kind of users and within ourselves as copyright specialists. 
So um, to enable myself to do all of these things, um, I needed to actively go about learning more about copyright. So um, I attended various conferences that were all really helpful for me. Um, I gained a lot of knowledge and I met some really helpful people. At one conference, for example, someone told me about Liz CopySeq, which I hadn't previously been aware of, and I signed up to this. Um, since then, reading through conversations on Liz CopySeq has been really helpful for me. Um, I've been able to see how others make decisions and the things that they consider when making those decisions. And that's been really invaluable for helping me think about how I make my own decisions. Um, even reading about things on Liz CopySeq that were somewhat irrelevant to my role helped to kind of establish a mindset around risk management when it comes to copyright and the general ways of kind of going about making copyright decisions. Also, of course, I was able to use Liz CopySeq to ask some specific questions that we had and I've always got really helpful responses. So thank you, because I'm sure lots of you are here today. Um, so as my knowledge on copyright developed, others within the library began to ask me if I could share my knowledge a bit more broadly. Um, so I've already touched on training academics with regards to reading lists, which continued and increased. Um, but I also began training other colleagues within the library. Uh, following this, our scholarly comms and research support manager asked me to deliver a copyright session alongside herself for early career researchers and postgraduate researchers. So my expertise at the time was copyright for teaching, um, which she and her role had less experience of. Um, and I'd say probably it had previously been a gap in our library team in terms of someone having that kind of knowledge as it kind of hadn't been seen as needed before we moved into using um, TALIS for our reading lists. In doing this teaching session, um, I began to learn more about the publishing side of copyright as well as the education side, and it really interested me. So I volunteered to help run sessions using the publishing trap and um, copyright the card game and the open access escape room. Um, and this enabled me to learn about a different side of copyright. I was also learning about this kind of publishing side of copyright a bit in my masters that I was doing alongside working full time. Um, so I studied distance learning from the University of Sheffield the Library and Information Services Management course. Um, and there's an academic libraries module that I took, which did touch upon copyright. Um, but I will say, admittedly, I did learn quite a lot more from um, my work than through my course, but it did help to kind of with some background knowledge. OK, so as my knowledge developed and I finished my master's, I successfully applied for a new role within our library um, where I became information literacy coordinator. And this overlapped a lot with scholarly communications. So my work around copyright for publishing grew as my work around publishing for kind of education decreased. Um, my colleague, Katrina Sunsbo, um, who by this stage was my line manager, tasked me with developing a new game alongside herself based on an initial idea she'd had when attending Ice Pops. Uh, this game became Copyright Day, which some of you may be aware of, um, and I very much learned about copyright as I went along with this. Um, and it became a very useful tool for myself um, long before we used it to teach others. As I was developing it, I learned a lot more about the things we were going to teach from the game. My role then became permanent as Scholarly Comms Coordinator, and I then began delivering and designing sessions on publishing and open access, which included lots of overlap with copyright. Um, as well as our copyright specific sessions, which we've continued to develop. I've also um, now in this role updated our LibGuide pages on copyright, and I'm looking to completely redesign these as soon as I get time. OK, so I'd done a lot of work and learning on copyright at this stage, but I wanted to become more part of the community to broaden my knowledge further. So when Chris and Jane set up the alt Corsig, it seemed ideal for me. Um, I'd been watching the Copyright in a Time of Crisis webinars and I found them to be really helpful and interesting. Um, Alt Call Sig shows, allows me sorry, to contribute to discussions around broadening knowledge of copyright within the sector, as well as broadening my own knowledge at the same time. It's also allowed me to contribute to webinars such as this um, and also to speak at I Can't Believe It's Not Ice Pops. Um, this year I've also been on secondment as the Scholarly Comms and Research Support Manager um, so I became a key contact within the university for copyright and publishing inquiries. This has really given me an opportunity to put my knowledge into practice and see more kind of real life examples of the kind of situations I'd previously only really taught about. 
I also still support the digitization team with some of their more complicated decision making. Um, so I try to keep up to date with that side of copyright as well. Um, and Alt Call SIG, Liz Copy Seek, and these webinars um, help to allow me to do this. So um, the key points I wanted to kind of end on is that if you're interested in copyright, um, volunteer for things, venture out of your comfort zone to learn new things, and don't be afraid to ask questions or admit you don't know the answers. Um, also, read, read as much as you can, um, keep up to date with things that are going on where you can, and learn from what you're reading and from the people that you're talking to. And also be confident in what you've learned. Um, I think that's something that we sometimes all lack as copyright specialists. Um, be confident in the knowledge that you do have. I also just wanted to finish by saying that joining a community has been really beneficial to me and I would definitely recommend it to others. Um, it shows that lots of people have the same issues and questions as I have and it's allowed me to discuss these with these people and learn from others as I go along. So finally, thank you all for listening to me today. Um, and if you have any questions at all, please do let me know. Oh, that's Thanks, brilliant. Uh, yeah, that was amazing. Really great. And I, I, I see that there, I mean, there are some, there's a question there in the chat. I think what, what we'll do is we, we, we will move on to the next speaker and we'll come back for some discussion later. But just to say, we'll find the link, but um, Hannah's excellent presentation on copyright dough we have that i'm pretty sure we have that as a recording and blog post that hannah's written which give the sort of background to all of that um, so certainly there's it's the, uh, an opportunity to dig in uh, to the work this excellent work that's been going on in essex but thank you again hannah yeah and we can come back to i think the question is about the strategies for gamification so maybe have a, be thinking about that hannah and we can discuss that um at the end so because i think yeah your copyright dough session was really really popular and I'm sure people are interested in the process you went through to develop that. Okay. Yeah, um, I can put some information in the chat as well. Okay, lovely, lovely. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. that'll be great. That'll be great. Um, but we'll come back to you um, in a moment because um, without further ado, we have another uh, fantastic speaker um, joining us this morning. Um, uh, coming um, all the way from Malta, I believe, um, we have Kate Vasili. Um, who uh, some might say is is the UK's longest serving copyright officer. I wouldn't wouldn't ever be so impolite, Kate, as to say such a thing. But you certainly have um, been working in this space for some time, haven't you? And, you're treading um, a very thin line there, Dan. You're doing very well. Continue. <laughs> I think it's 22 years now. Yeah, I have been around a long time. <laughs> that was not I'm really the oldest. Oh God. <laughs> Time to retire. <laughs> but I do. I think. I think it's it's good to have somebody also who's worked in the field for a long time as well, because I think the contrast of kind of coming into a field being quite new is also, you know, really what what make what makes you stay, Kate? What is it for you that makes you get up in the morning? Yeah, so yeah, you'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Other than trips to Malta. <laughs> okay, I'm starting with an apology as well because while Hannah was speaking, somebody started drilling on the wall next door. So bear with me. <laughs> I, I, think, I think it's the morning for that. It's the morning for <laughs> drilling. <laughs> okay, so becoming a copyright specialist, and I'm calling this my accidental journey, and you'll see why. <laughs> so, was it my childhood dream? Obviously not. I hadn't even heard of copyright, like most people in my generation, let alone a copyright officer role. So that wasn't the, the, the reason. I really aspired to be a, um, a fashion designer, really. And I was really interested in fashion. And these were my first attempts. I used to dress my Cindy doll. This isn't my picture, but somebody obviously had the same talent as me. Um, and then I used to badger my mum to make me clothes by drawing pictures and telling her what to do and she used to hate me for it. In reality I didn't know what I wanted to do so I accidentally ended up doing a B.Ed in education at Goldsmiths. Initially I wanted to do art because that's what I liked um, but the art course was full so I was told and they, they um, persuaded me to join the B.Ed course saying I could move. That didn't happen. So three years later, I dropped out. I, I was working at WH Smith as my Saturday role from school and as a cash officer because they thought I was a genius just because I got a B and O level. Um, so when I left uni, I they, they took me on full time until I decided what I wanted to do. 
Um, a kindly neighbour took pity on me and got me an interview at the, jo at the company he worked, um, which was Stuart Wrightson's International. They don't exist anymore. They were taken over a couple of times and now I think they've just sort of disappeared into the ether. But that was a wow. Working in the city, I was just so amazed. But again, that was um, a credit control assistant. So in finance, again, so you can see accidentally I've gone into accounting from my first interest in art and fashion. After that, I left to work as a system of financial accountant for Xerox um, Europe, Middle East and Africa office. Um, and one a wedding and two babies later and a move to Marlow, which I couldn't do. My husband wouldn't move, even though Marlow is an amazing place. Um, I ended up doing like various temping jobs again in accounting. And the final straw was when I got a full time, not full time, part time permanent job with a PR agency, which was great in some respects. I got to meet Kylie Minogue and Gary Barlow and got freebie tickets to Peter Andre and the Spice Girls. But the accountant was really um, reluctant to relinquish any power. So she had me stuffing envelopes, really, of invoices and um, the um, stylists bills or you know pay pay slips and things so I thought I have to get out of here and my aim was to find part-time term time only job that I could do while looking after the kids and wow the perfect job came along in the local paper wanted a copyright assistant part-time term time only box ticked, education to A-level, box ticked, accounting experience, box ticked, no prior copyright knowledge required, which was amazing. <laughs> so I, I applied literally for the first um, criteria because that was my um, goal. And this was the Bounds Green campus. I don't know if anybody, probably nobody, oh, someone did. <laughs> Katie Kinnear used to work there. <laughs> um, yeah, we we worked there. It was like a big industrial unit, but it soon closed down. And Wendy, well. <laughs> um, so my tasks were at the beginning um, to process the photocopy requests and payments through the CLA Clarks system. Many of you won't have even heard of this. It was back when every single um, photocopying request we had to do, it was paid for transactionally. Um, a bit like SEPs now. So it was, you paid by extract per page for number of students. And that was why they needed an accounting person. The other reason they didn't want anyone with copyright knowledge, I was told, was because the law had just changed and also the licensing. So they needed someone to learn from scratch and not have any prior history to confuse it. So, um, also I had to do direct permissions as well where they fell outside the license. And back then we used the Clark system, which was an online database to determine if something was li were licensed or excluded, et cetera, which was a bit of a nightmare because it was never right and we had to phone them all the time to clarify. So it meant learning copyright and licensing from scratch. And my then manager wanted to offload copyright. She hated it. So she wanted to concentrate on staff development. And she literally pushed me to go to every conceivable copyright training session out there. I studied the CDPA, the licenses closely. I joined this copy seek straight away, and that was that was absolutely the, the best tool for me because at the time it had all the oldies like Charles Oppenheim, um, Tony ba Toby Bainton, Lawrence Bebbington, Sol Picciotto, and they always used to debate things and it was it was hilarious. It was quite amusing at some times. Um, I also read extensively, so any cases, articles, blogs, IPCAT blog was really good, and Outlaw.com were my go-tos as well. And then later on, I studied the other terms of the other licenses too, because that I sort of um, got shifted onto my role as well. Eventually, my manager retired, and I ended up doing all the copyright training for academic staff and other staff as well, but also for students. So um, post postgraduate students and also the uh, media study students who use a lot of copyright content as well. And that's continued throughout my career. So all change. First, we had the Infosoc Directive. Again, a lot of you won't have heard of this. 
um, it's when um, the government or EU Parliament wanted to harmonise all the European copyright laws across all the states. This failed miserably because they just let every state choose which exceptions they wanted to add to their law. So we ended up with a sort of mishmash again. So it didn't do anything. What it did do is introduce the non-commercial aspect in the exceptions. Later, we had the UK CLA and DAX copyright tri tribunal case. And this is what instigated the removal of the Clark system. So basically we were paying twice. We were paying massive licensing fees and then paying again for the transactional copying. So that was abolished, thank God. And that was when um, the Universities UK copy um, and Guild HE copyright working group was formed basically to help with that case um, and now you know it as CNAC. We are now the Copyright Negotiating and Advisory Committee. So during that time, about 2004, I decided to start legal training. The reason for this was mainly all the comments I was getting and the questions I was being asked is what is your legal background and um, Where's, what's, yeah, what is your background and do you have any legal training? So, of course, I felt like a bit sort of a bit coerced. So I did the, the law degree, but I wouldn't say it's necessary, although some people feel comfortable having a law background. Um, then the license changed again. It became the photocopying and scanning license. So we had to learn all the new aspects of that and all the different requirements and restrictions that came with that as well. Um, and then it's been changing ever since, as you can see from this slide, every time we negotiate a new license, there's changes as well. And then we came to COVID-19 and Brexit, which, as you know, from these webinars caused a headache for everybody. My personal journey, as you can see, I've been sent to present in various countries across the world or to um, to help promote products like TADC and, and DCS. Um, so I would say my journey hasn't been boring at all. As you know, I'm now in Malta, although that's nothing to do with copyright. It's still an opportunity that I would not have envisaged when I started out my career. The requirements are the same, continue to maintain awareness and changes of copyright legislation and licensing and then to provide expert advice to staff and students. Although I do manage the digitization team, I I also provide um, advice to scholarly comms, to publishing, um, to all sorts of research students and staff as well. So I'm basically an all rounder for all things copyright and I'm learning all the time. And that's all I can say. That's my journey to copyright. It wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't um, intended at all. Kate, listening everyone. Kate, that's amazing. I don't know if you've been following all the chat that's been going on during your... We're trying to, we're trying to keep on track with time as well. I think we're now at the point of um, you've got to write your uh, memoirs and it's going to be turned into a film and we're just discussing who's going to play you. Yeah, Rachel Weiss, I think absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I think we might... Oh, I, I do like Rachel, but yeah. they're all pretty amazing. Oh, I'm really flattered. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Oh, Kate, okay, thank you so much. It's such a, a trip down memory lane for many people as well. And uh, yeah, a lot of people have heard the story before. So. Fascinating journey. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I want to get our last speaker on and um, I hope we are then going to have a little bit of time for a few uh, questions and discussion. Um, so um, I'm going to move this on, Kate, but really thank you so much and um, really appreciate you doing this because I know also you're heading back from Malta um, just straight after this webinar, aren't you? So um, we, if you have to disappear for, before the end to catch a plane, we will know why. You are the Jet Set Copyright uh, Officer. So uh, thank you very, very much. And it's now my very great pleasure to introduce our third and final uh, a speaker today, who is Simon Cox from uh, University of West of England. Um, he's entitled this Journey of the Anti-Expert. So, um, Simon, we're looking forward to hearing what you've got to tell us. 
I, I might have oversold that slightly, but we'll see. We'll see. Oh, God, God I can see the spelling mistake. I'm the coy right specialist. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I'm really sorry. First of all, I'm really sorry for my spelling, which you can't see on my notes, but that is going to bug me all the way through. Uh, but there we are. So I'm more more sorry that you get two pictures of me looming out at you from from your workplaces or your kitchens or whatever. Uh, it just It's just to show that when I was a lad, the bloke on the left, 25 years ago, 20, I was 25 then, I'd uh, just moved house to my first house, uh, just moved in with Katie, my partner, uh, I'd scored 151 runs and I'd, I'd had that that sub-editor's dream of a headline in the Evening Post in Bristol. Yes, I, the, the, odd enough, being, having red hot cocks out there is is not necessarily always good for, you, for the soul, sadly not. Anyway, so there I am, uh, I've just about to work at UE. So three months later, uh, and and in and that that began yeah, the journey. Oh, I heard myself then. Crikey. Okay. So when I came to this, ten minutes, I thought I can give this a go, uh, and my subconscious has been whirring away ever since up until about yesterday afternoon to think about my journey and what it is to be an expert, uh, and it's good practice because I'm I'm about to mortify my daughter by appearing on a careers panel at her school. And given that I always embarrass her, uh, it's gonna be a, a new way that I can offer excruciating pain to her. Sadly, you don't get any pictures of before uh, 1998. I had much longer hair and there were some, there were some good pictures of me out there from Reading in 91 and Glastonbury in 92. But, but we, we'll leave that, we'll leave that. Okay, so, oh, I do my own slides, but not the ones here. So uh, my journey, so yeah, the, the most boring part of my journey is actually the last part of getting this job, but I'll give you a potted career history uh, in that. So uh, about two years ago, two and a half years ago, I found myself in a bit of a predicament. I'd been managing the immigration service at UE and I'd been here for a long time by that point. Uh, and my teams were being restructured. I had managed two teams as part of that service and part of that restructuring meant that, that they didn't need a me anymore. Which, so on one level, I was really happy because all of my teams were being moved on effectively. Uh, but as you can imagine, by that point, a mid, mid 40s year man with two kids, a cat, no dog at that point, that's a certain amount of pressure. So I was more than relieved to find myself in a redeployment position and being told, well, there's a copyright and projects officer role out there, uh, and that might be up your street, and to go through the process and to get the job. Uh, I come to this, I came to this knowing nothing. I'd, I'd worked at UE for God knows how many years before that, 20 plus, 25 years by that point, and I'd worked no more than 100 yards from the library throughout that period, and I'd probably, I'd taken out one book in that entire period where my partner was teach on a teaching program at another university and needed to borrow a book. So my knowledge of the library and other areas was limited. So that's not to sound ungrateful for any of my chances to get this role on. I'm exceptionally grateful, but it's I come at this from a, a really uh, a limited experience position. Uh, but that said, I think the part I find interesting is actually the, the whole process showed me that you do have skills and they are transferable. And this is the kind of my reflections on what it is to be whatever this expert role is. So let's get, let's get Billy up. Okay, so Billy. So Billy there, I do like Billy, Billy Bragg. I think this is from quite early on. So we're not talking recent Billy. That's probably talking to the tax man about poetry, Billy, I guess. Uh, but yeah, so I kind of always say that I've got a few very limited qualities that are probably undervalued uh, and ultimately I've kind of bring it down to oh dear as it's it, that age I fear so uh, my my soul skill I've always thought is I can read relatively complicated stuff understand it relatively quickly and turn it into relatively easily explained stuff I, I always felt that's not that's not a massive skill uh, but it's one of those things where I think, oh, crikey, uh, I've underplayed that. And actually, it's quite a good one to have. I'm realistic enough to know that I'm not like a, 
a big I'm a thinker but I'm not like an academic thinker like Emily I, I, I again have lots of admiration for the work Emily's done Emily Hudson's done with the whole kind of approach to uh, exemptions and that kind of thing but I'm kind of conscious that I don't come from that angle my background is very much from that Billy Bragg perspective of being a bit of a uh, sticking it to the man kind of a thing to a certain extent so I my background going back is one of working in student funding so helping students get the right level of funding the right level of welfare benefits challenging decisions made by housing benefit teams and student low company decisions and going way back by the uh, local authorities when they manage this stuff and I kind of always did that from a bit of a yeah looking at regulations trying to spot the gap in the guidance to see what was said and what wasn't said and going back and saying I don't think you're right I think you've not it doesn't say this you should do this this or this and give or take I've kind of mad I everything spun from that kind of I say passion and I kind of overplay that but there's a bit of a passion thing to that uh, and it led on so I end up doing immigration advice again supporting students with that kind of thing and moving on I kind of grew in experience I managed teams I grew, teams grew as legislation came in around immigration I took on institutional stuff but it was all based on that kind of absolutely all based on that kind of thing of really looking for the gaps the other thing that i do and this is not a plea for questions just yet is i'm quite curious uh and i kind of i was thinking about this and actually i do two things one i kind of always have this rather negative assumption that i'm probably the least knowledgeable person in any room uh, I always think I don't know the answer or I'll always, always prepare to go and look and the second is being quite curious now I've done jobs including this one where being curious is a benefit because if I'm not being curious about work stuff I end up fixating on whether Starbucks and Costa actually owe me money because I've had black coffee for the past 15 years and never had any milk and I tend to think if that's 5p per cup surely they owe me about 1500 quid by now uh, equally, I ponder whether, if you've seen the film Independence Day, which is an ageing reference, I accept, when Will Smith's fiance gets into the gets into that storage duct and as the tunnel was exploding, would that would she really have survived? It's kind of the pointless, stupid stuff that I've kind of I do in the rest of my life, but that's getting a bit niche. Uh, more usefully, I think when I've gone to training events, so I've done the been to Naomi Corn's events and th with this role I've always been happy to ask a question and whether I've kind of I, li I like asking questions I like I don't like that void and I'm quite conscious when I've given presentations that that gap where you say any questions is uh, is like really panicky because you're really thinking crikey does anybody care do they have any questions and I can already see my daughter's peers looking at my rather aged grey face thinking he's talked a load of old rubbish there what has he got to tell us but so, so I've always asked a question sometimes from sympathy sometimes because I am genuinely curious but I've always found a way to ask a question uh, in this role it's quite easy to believe I'm the least experienced person in the room because I'm so new and I still think I'm so new so I think it's I've always been I, I kind of I'm good at thinking I'm the least experienced person and for me it's a way of keeping myself in check even though I'd been doing those other roles for years and years and years I always wanted to challenge myself to say is what you think true true and do you need to find out again and reacquaint yourself with that uh, I should stress at this point there is a difference between challenging yourself and feeling a bit rubbish generally uh, I've done feeling a bit rubbish generally and it took me a long time to convince myself that actually what I would think of as doing down is actually a fairly rigorous approach right and then he keeps on going to the wrong so this is now the end i wonder what i wrote for the end ah uh, yeah i have rambled and ambled quite enough uh i genuinely am never sure what level of insight i can give to anybody about being an expert for me it's it's only ever been a journey through a, a slightly personal journey based around a bit of neurosis a bit of passion and about being curious now if that means that i've turned into an expert 
then that's great. Uh, it's just, I, again, I don't consider myself to be that. I consider myself still to be the person always learning and always trying to find a bit of a loophole somewhere. And there you are. Simon, that's brilliant. Thank you so much for that. I think we've been we've been commenting on the chat as you've been talking. Um, and I think certainly what you're saying resonates with me. What why is copyright interesting? It's mm. I mean clearly it is interesting, but what interests interests me is what the values are that come out of it. What is it about you and your place within the community that you're working with and how can you help people do stuff and how can you in fact find those things within the law, within what look like fairly scary, scary formal frameworks that appear to be rigid sets of rules, and in fact aren't. They're, they're things that are that clearly do have, um, you know, the legal force. But nonetheless, you're working your way through that, and it's, you've got to be able to, to to sort of work on that basis. Um, so that that's great. Shall we? So we've we've stopped sharing the slides, um, and I think we have. Uh, a few We've minutes got about left. five minutes, I think. Yeah, if yeah, anyone would yeah. like to ask questions, I don't know if our three speakers would be able to pop their cameras back on and uh, be willing to answer anything. So we're going to ask, what questions do you have? Not does anyone have any questions? I mean, I know we've had a lot of we've had a lot of chat here, but um, I, I I do have a question actually, if I if I may uh, jump in and ask all of our um, uh, panelists, and it, it's it's really about. Uh, where you sit as a copyright specialist within the the organization and so you, I find myself you talk to people who are extremely learned educated qualified uh, but they don't necessarily know they as much about copyright as you do so mm. how does that fit within an academic environment then and you're talking to students but you're talking to to academic colleagues or others who who um you know need your support but there's sometimes that feeling isn't there between well are you an expert or not which has, has been through all of those uh, presentations um i wonder whether can we start uh, can i start with hannah actually hannah have you got any thoughts on that because you were the one that throws that whole thing about expert in in inverted commas yeah um <clears throat> oh sorry um i think where we struggle is that we are kind of seen as the expert when it comes to teaching and delivering training sessions to um pgrs and early career researchers um and academics would probably come to us but i think where we sort of struggle is that actually there's a lot of professional services staff that would really benefit from knowing more about copyright but they probably don't see it in the same way and that there's kind of pockets of knowledge about copyright um, or intellectual property or different aspects of these kind of things that overlap within different sections of professional services and it's actually bringing those people together that we found to be really difficult so I mentioned that I want to redo our copyright pages on our libguide but actually on the university website we've got information about copyright on our library pages there's stuff about intellectual property say on some of the other pages IT have got some stuff about copyright um, kind of on their pages and it's all this kind of um, disjointed stuff when it comes more to the professional services that's something I really want to spend time on to bring bring all together so I think there's probably several people within the institution that would describe themselves as a copyright specialist but getting those people together to pool our knowledge is probably what's missing um, I don't know if that answers your question at all yeah no, that 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 makes sense and that's certainly what we've been trying to do more of uh, here at Kent um but and Kate so you know you've been you've been in that position um over the years and I think presumably people know at your institution you're the go-to person when it comes to copyright um so how do you feel that that has, has that developed over the years do you feel that people uh kind of when you first were in the role would would question what you were saying and now it's easier to do that and and, and also because you have actually a, a legal qualification what, what, what's your thoughts on on that it's sort of a swings and roundabout situation so uh, early on obviously people didn't know i existed and quite quite a few years on they still didn't know i existed um, despite me sending out regular emails about the copyright license and audits that we were undergoing etc cetera, etc cetera, which caused amazing panic but to be fair, I think it was those CNA audits that sort of pushed the wider community to, to be more connected. 
So my copyright web pages aren't within the library. They're actually sitting on the intra staff intranet under the same ones as the IP team, etc. And I work closely with the IP team. So any IP questions I get, I can normally give an answer, a very basic answer, but I would refer them on to the specialists, especially when it's regarding publishing contracts, etc., and funding agreements. Also with the scholarly comms team, I work very closely with them as well. So we've sort of got a lot closer. I had a problem with the learn online learning team because they tended to just grab copies of my pages and upload them onto their site. But I soon stopped them doing that when I pointed out that their pages, the information was way out of date because they were copying. So now I've sort of trained them to link to the copyright pages instead of copying them, which was a big challenge at the time, but it's working now. Um, and I think it's worked well over the COVID period because I was giving them information that's up to date without, you know, having that. But yeah, they, they sort of trust me more now. Now they know I also have a law degree. It's a bit easier. <laughs> It, okay yeah mm. thanks Kate and, and Simon you 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 know you're you're sort of talking about your approach and, and your more recent in this area um and uh, through the um, where you know you've been doing a lot of having as we all have having to do a lot of uh representing and discussing about copyright risk how's that changed then in relation to what people expect from you and and the kind of uh, awareness <laughs> there is I think I, again, I, we don't, we're not mandatory in terms of training here. I think the interesting part for me is, and I've always, it's, I think, trying to find somebody who's got a proper vested interest in what you're doing. Uh, so I, with my various professional services roles, I know people, I know people, but I know people in various other ways. So I know people in finance and that kind of thing. So I think it's, it's trying to find another route to go through to get to your right audience. So I know the head of finance at UE, uh, and I know that that's probably a better angle to present risk to and get a movement within faculties and departments because there's a pounds and pence type of angle. Coming from my immigration background, when we the, like the institutional audits from the UKVI, everyone has a collie wobble about because there's this kind of precipice view of we won't be able to recruit international students. And there's nothing that focuses the mind more than the risk of losing money, in my experience. And if you can get that the buy-in from somebody who's going to be who has a, a pound and pence view on it which is dreadfully dull and a bit accounting based but it's trying to find the right route into things i'm kind of if i'm not getting the response from a local level program level i'm, I'm going to try and find a way where we can make it more relevant thanks simon um th that's great we i, I noticed that it is now 12 o'clock uh, so i think we're going to need to wrap up the discussion but what i thought we'd do is if if you're okay to stay here maybe five more minutes i see yeah, I'm that um, Kate might need to go but yeah we've, um, but we, we've, we do we've have that we've got some interesting questions coming up about mandatory yeah. training and i think in most places it's fair to say it probably isn't mandatory although jill um was just saying it was at hers but um, have you just seen the question from Billy about um, what would you say are the basics of being a copyright specialist? I think that's a really. I interesting thought that, I question. thought that would be a really good uh, sort of final question to ask the panel, really, to to mm. see if you could boil it down. What is the sort of basic principle of how you go about doing it? Clearly, there's more I than think one we approach. Let Kate go first as well, and yes. then she Let's can, get Kate she can go hop first. on that plane. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're muted, Kate. Sorry, I thought I clicked it. No <laughs> um, we have an in-house lawyer as well, but she refers everything to me because it's not her specialism. But I would say that the basics are you start with the CDPA 1988, but also all these amazing books by Facet Publishing and certain authors that we very know really well. But um, also the licensing terms are the key if you're working in academia in higher education. So they're, they're your basics to being um, a higher education copyright specialist. And everything else you just learn along the way, the job. List copy seek archives are great too. Thanks, Kate. Thanks, Kate. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, do head off if you need to. We're really yeah. grateful for you to join us. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. Should we go to Hannah next? Yes, let's. Hi, yeah, um, so similarly to what Kate said, I think kind of the 
known about copyright licenses of, and um, exceptions and things like that are obviously crucial. Um, from my perspective in scholarly comms, knowing about um, publishing different copyright licenses and kind of third party uh, copyright when it comes to publishing. Um, but I think really a fundamental thing of being a copyright specialist and something that I always tried to go back to is thinking about that kind of risk management approach and thinking about appetite for risk um, and those kind of things. And I think always just putting yourself in the shoes of the copyright creator and thinking how you would feel about it if it was your work that you'd created and the way that it's being reused um, and thinking about any potential harms. I think those kind of fundamental principles are something that when we sometimes get tied in knots around the legislation or the, perhaps the more complicated things, if you can just take a step back and remember those principles, and um, that's what I find to be the most kind of helpful thing to remember. Yeah, that, I think that's really important, Hannah, and it's that we always talk about it, uh, about risk, about it's not clear cut right and wrong in many of these situations and just framing it in that way, I think is an important thing. Um, so Simon, can we go to you? Uh, yeah, I, I was going to, the risk thing is, is kind of, uh, it intrigues me because I think I can never tell whether I placed the discussion on risk at the beginning of any thoughts about what's happening or at the end, because you can spend a lot of time going through exemptions and, and, and exceptions and, and the whole set of regulations. But if it, you end up with this, what's the risk? And I can never tell whether that's a trump card or one to keep in the background. Uh, and the other thing I've just, it's, it's, it's reading and it's, it is to a certain extent being interested in it. I kind of, I did get obsessed around at the beginning of the pandemic, the difference between uh, providing uh, the, the whole online film program thing, the difference between in in hotel streaming of music and films to televisions as opposed to the web and all sorts of, I, I got quite hung up on because it just struck me as the legislation was harking back to a different age to when we found ourselves in, but that's. Uh, uh, thanks for that, Simon. Yeah, that, and that is quite, that's one of the con uh, consistent challenges in copyright is that the laws are really conceived at the time when the technology was different and it always uh, struggles to keep up and actually you, there's a lot of hard work and in fact contradictory information about exactly how you should view something from a legal context. Um, so I think that just, just to, to wrap up on because I think also Billy's question was related to, from the position of being a, a, a lawyer and I think there is from what uh, Jane and I have always said is that, that being a copyright specialist is not the same thing as being a lawyer. We can't, we, we cannot provide legal advice. Um, and in some ways it's about having that context specific uh, information and trying to put that information to be accurate about the law, to use and draw on sources of authority, but to add something else to it that is very much about what is the organization, what are the people within it trying to do and how can you facilitate and make that happen. So I think that's come through really strongly in all three really presentations yeah. and, and um, just but, a, but all very different yeah 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 and i think people are enjoying hearing um I'm, I'm actually starting to think chris maybe we could have a book collecting people's journeys or something some, some let's sort of... add it to the list of projects there's there's, <laughs> there's not enough we're not doing enough no no, no 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 we're not like, but you, yeah, i always i always, I always like to find us things to keep us busy in the dark winter days so yeah so yeah but thank I you think... thank you hannah thank you kate thank you uh, Simon and uh, yeah, future webinars. Go go for it. The next scheduled one. We were we, we've we've been in touch with the intellectual property office who were scheduled to do one early December. They're not going to be ready to do that, but in future we will be hearing from the intellectual property office on their IP education framework, which is going to be really interesting to see that. Um, so that'll be in due course. So the next one we've decided to skip that, and not slot another one in so we've got our christmas special coming up on 17th of december so if we will be in touch with people about what we might need you to prepare we'll, for that yeah um we're kind of billing this as confessions of a learning technologist i, I don't that's sure that's a working title what we want to hear from is from the learning technology community about their experiences of copyright we know many of those who join in are from within library teams that have as we've seen the scholarly communications and the reading list focus but but what's it look like for those who are actually advising on the nuts and bolts of how you use learning technology and, and how and we already they have we already have right. one volunteer i think uh, signed up so we're just tracking down a couple more learning technologists so it if does. you know anyone who arm you can twist tell them what yeah. fun they'll have if they join us 
Um, Absolutely. And then February is going to be a really exciting um, month. We um, we have a week um, that uh, is celebrated usually in the US and Canada. It's called Fair, Fair Dealing, Fair Use Week. And uh, we will also send you some further information about our thoughts for that. But we are really hoping to. Uh, yes, it's 2022. You are right. 2022. Yes, <laughs> correct. We're, we're hoping um, to uh, see if we can encourage lots of libraries to put on events during that week, similar to uh, the sorts of things that you do for Open Access Week. But more about that, we're going to post on List Copy Seek and, yes. and do a blog post. And of course, the okay. technology session is also next year, not earlier this year. It is, yes, that's true. We, we are so, a year behind ourselves. <laughs> we are. Uh, so there's the formal end. As always, we like to end on something a bit silly. And then, so what is this? This is a meeting. Gonna, okay, so I invited time. you to meetings. So this is just to say that Justine has tentatively accepted a tentative meeting at 10 to 10 uh, in, uh, in Tenterton. Um, I don't think there's much more we need to say about that. I don't think there is either. I think, nope. I think okay. we're leaving it there. That just shows how our minds work sometimes. Yes. <laughs> the uh, kinds of so pointless course. conversations. We're always very efficient and effective. When, when yeah. people aren't listening. <laughs> uh, okay. So uh, on that note, thank you very much for your time. Thanks again to all of our amazing speakers. Um, and no doubt we will be returning to this topic in some other mm -hmm. form. It's really important. Um, thing to see how we personally and uh, organizationally respond to to this area of work yeah thanks everyone bye